Well, I want to thank everyone for coming here today. I'm, I'm delighted that you are here. I have never seen this lecture room prepared in this way. I imagine the undergraduate students would be really, really excited if they could see this. Uh, gladly, they are away, so we wouldn't get into troubles if we're doing this. But well, uh, let me just welcome you to the Jordan Hall of Science. Uh, since 2006, the Jordan Hall has been the flagship undergraduate uh, science teaching facility at Notre Dame. And I haven't introduced myself, so this is the time where I have to introduce myself. So I'm Santiago Schnell. I was recently appointed the William K. Warren uh, Foundation Dean of the College of Science. Uh, my appointment happened on September 1st uh, last year, so I'm starting my 10th month. Uh, uh, so I, But, but maybe you won't applause if you know where I'm coming from. I'm coming from the University of Michigan. <laughs> uh, well, let, let me rest assured here that uh, when I have my first Science Advisory Council, I burn all my Michigan paraphernalia. <laughs> so we, we had a, a fantastic barbecue, and I offered to everyone to showcase that, you know, I'm now a Notre Dame fan and a faculty member, that I couldn't left any remaining Michigan paraphernalia in my hands, and it happened. But well, at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm, as, as a dean, so as well, I have a faculty appointment, so I have a research active group, and I'm professor of the Department of Biological Sciences, and as well, I'm professor of the Department of Applied and Computational Mathematics and Statistics. And you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. So, and I'm excited because I'm a new dean, and because I recently joined, so this is my first Notre Dame reunion, so I'm experiencing uh, what is the spirit of the place when the alumni are back and having a really great time. And well, I'm excited as well for the program today. So it's, as I explained, so it's, it's a really great way to have the running here. And it's a sponsor and supported by the Luna Association and the Notre Dame family of wines, which is a collection of wine uh, uh, from all Notre Dame collection. And, uh, and you're going to be sampling uh, some of the portfolio today. And I'm probably going to see if I can escape from my dean obligations and join you. And well, my background, so as you notice from my appointments, is in mathematical biology, which you can imagine from the name and my appointments in two departments, is a highly interdisciplinary research field. So I study complex biomedical uh, systems in a field where experts from different uh, uh, specialties must collaborate and reach the best outcomes when it comes into science. And this is one of the reasons I'm really excited about the subject we're going to be covering today which is a geography of growing raw materials, uh, uh, the transition of the chemistry behind the creation of beer, wine, and spirits, which then meets our knowledge of science, of the body to aid our enjoyment of a physical world, which is wines that you are going to be testing here through the senses. Geography, chemistry, biology coming all together, so to create adult beverages. So this is the way to do science. So now I think I committed a mistake to become a mathematical biologist. Uh, uh, and to further explore these relationships today, so we have three talented uh, faculty members from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. So please meet Holly Goodson. Uh, we have Ken Uno. So and then the, we have uh, Dan Gesetzler. So Holly. Holly, Ken, and Dan, so I want to thank you for being here. So uh, I know that you enjoy this, uh, but at the same time, you know, we are enjoying your expertise and showcasing what we can do in the Notre Dame faculty. And well, I want to introduce our special alumni guest today, which is Dr. Andrew Waterhouse, so class from <laughs> 77. And you know, Andy is a professor of ethnology in the Department of Viticulture Ethnology at the University of California, Davis and he's the director of the Robert Mondavi Institute of Wine and Food Science. And again, I committed a mistake going to mathematical biology. Uh, so Robert Mondavi Institute for Wine and Food Science at UC Davis engaged the public in presenting and discussing uh, uh, topics like food policy, technology, testing, and with a focus on UC Davis researchers. And, and much like Think Notre Dame, uh, but as well for uh, good food and wines lovers. Yes. 
So the institute has learned from COVID-19, so to broadcast their presentations, and as well to present everything that we're going to be experiencing here today online. So if you are interested in joining to any of these seminars, I strongly encourage you to go to the institute website. And well, are there any members here of the class of uh, 1977? So if they are, okay, this is really exciting. So you have one of you coming here to, to give us a bit of at one tasting, but as well of tasting of why good quality signs. And well, I want to welcome Andy Waterhouse. So I really appreciate that you are here. And well, let's just have some fun today. Thank you. So I think we're going to go sit at a bar and have a conversation about wine, okay? So uh, we'll see how that goes, but we will include all of you. Actually, Dan needs to be there. Sandy, why don't we get started? Could you tell us more about how wine is made? How do you go from grape to glass, as you see in front of you? And who's involved and what do they do? Okay, well, we'll try to do this in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so the first step in making wine is, of course, to uh, grow the grapes. And um, where the grapes grow is very important. And the, the variety of the grapes, which you're probably familiar with, Chardonnay, Cabernet, is, is forms the key flavors in the, in the wine. Um, but once we get the grapes growing in a particular vineyard, and depends, uh, you know that certain places are better than others. You've all heard of Napa Valley or Burgundy or Chianti. Those are places which, by the way, are great to visit. Um, and uh, I have to go there for work. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, so, so grapes tend to grow well in really nice places, and uh, the better places, the, the better the weather and so on, the better the wine. Um, and then once the grapes get ripe, and of course to do that, we're careful of when to harvest and so on, um, we uh, usually measure the amount of sugar in the grapes, and uh, the winemaker has to go out and taste the, taste the, taste the fruit as well to see whether they're ready to, ready to, to harvest. Um, and then we bring the grapes into the winery. Um, then the next step is to crush the fruit and press it if you're making a white wine. Um, and at this point, the vineyard manager lets go of the, of the project and the winemaker takes over. Actually, the winemaker makes that decision of when to harvest the grapes. It has a huge impact on the flavor. In fact, we'll be tasting a comparison of that. Um, so the winemaker makes that call when to, har when to, when to bring the, the fruit in. Then it's processed with crushing, pressing, and so on, and, and fermentation. And the fermentation is, um, there's two, actually two basic ferments. Uh, the yeast fermentation, that converts the sugar into alcohol. That's the one thing you're most interested in, I'm sure. Um, and you may be familiar with that if you're familiar with anything about winemaking. Um, but then there's a secondary fermentation we call the malolactic, and that's actually conducted by lactic acid bacteria. And uh, th these ba this bacteria is very common in lots of food products. Lots of pickles are fermented um, using lactic acid bacteria. Yogurt is a product of lactic acid bacteria and so on. Um, so anyway, that's often done in wine. Um, it actually changes the flavor. So the decision of using that or not is, is a winemaking decision. Um, and then we go through, once the fermentations are done, there's usually some aging. Um, three to 12 months, typical. Um, some red wines may be in a barrel for a couple of years. Um, and then once the aging is done, um, you then bottle it, and usually it'll head off to market fairly quickly. Some places will hold on the bottles for a little bit, um, and then it'll get distributed. So the wine market is highly regulated because it's alcoholic beverage, and so the, there's a distribution system where you have to go through this intermediary, 
the distributor. Um, and then, then the wine goes to retail. So in, in, in it's complicated if you're trying to start a winery. Um, many of our graduates at UC Davis do this. And you, you basically, you have, it's like dealing with 50 countries. Every state has a different distribution system. So if you talk to people who are starting out, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, we sell our wines in Pennsylvania and Florida and California. And I'll say, well, why did you pick those places? Oh, I happen to have a friend at a distributorship in Florida, so that's why we have our wine there. I mean, it's that messy and complicated. Um, and then you buy the wine and taste it. Well, a a Andy, now, now that we know how wines are made, we know that there's different kinds of wines, right? We can see in front of us there's reds and whites, but surely there's more nuance to this, right? There's more subtlety, obviously. Could you in, tell us more about this? Okay, so, so white wines, okay, so all, well, near, nearly all grapes have white juice, okay? So, so Cabernet, famous red wine, the juice of the Cabernet grape is actually white. That, that grape, if you crush it, you get white juice. And uh, that's how you make, uh, well, okay, so, so white wines are all made from white grapes. Red wines are made from red grapes, but rosés are typically made with red grapes where you limit the amount of color that comes out of the grape. So the color is all in the skin, and you crush the fruit and start the process, and if, depending on how much color you want in that rosé, you leave it in contact with the skins for either a very short period, maybe almost zero, up to maybe one day. Wait, wait, so Andy, that means that you can make a white wine using red grapes? Yes. Oh. Yes, you can. It might have a little bit of color in it if you're not too careful, but yes, you could do that, yeah. Now, there's another, there's another color name out there, but it's an unusual wine, and that's orange wine. And that's wine made using white grapes with the skin. So you're, you're, you're using red wine making techniques where you crush the fruit, you leave the skins there with the juice during the fermentation, and you get some tannin into the wine. Now you don't get hardly as much as if you made red wine because of some chemistry I don't have time to get into. But, <laughs> But uh, we did an experiment recently, and, and the amount of tannin that you get out with, with the pigment there is a lot higher. Um, so, and now those wines are unusual. Uh, in the old, old days, meaning more than a couple hundred years ago, most white wines were made as orange wines. And that's because the tannin from the skins and seeds in that wine actually gives it aging potential, which was very important in the, a long time ago because Wines didn't last very long. We didn't have good bottles, and most consumers couldn't afford bottles. I'm talking more than 200 years ago. Um, and so to, to, to have the wine last a full year, um, you had to do something. Um, so then we have those, and then um, we have bubbly wines. We call them sparkling wines. And that's actually, uh, the fermentation process produces both alcohol and carbon dioxide. Now normally we let the carbon dioxide just evaporate out of the tank. Um, but for sparkling, you ferment in a sealed container, which can be the bottle in which you buy the wine. Um, and that causes the wine to become carbonated or sparkling. Okay, cool. Then with uh, all of this new knowledge about how wine is made, I guess you guys all want to start tasting it, right? <laughs> Okay, but before we get to tasting, I actually need to talk a little bit about how your sense of taste and smell works, okay? So you've all heard things like, oh, this wine tastes of dark cherries, and it's like, well, how could that possibly be? And you've also heard things like, most of taste is smell, but why, okay? And so to explain that, I briefly need to talk about how your eyes work, because believe it or not, your eyes work about the same way your taste and smell do. So you're familiar with the fact probably you've got three different types of cones in your eyes, right? Um, ones that, that absorb primarily in red, blue, and green. But you also know that you can, you can see the whole spectrum. 
Okay, how do you do that? It's because of the combination of, uh, of uh, the cones that a particular wavelength or mixture of wavelengths will make. And so that's how you see purple or brown or anything like that. And so now you know that it's the combination of receptor triggering that can give you this spectrum from three receptors. You can start to understand how taste works because you have a limited number of taste receptors and more smell receptors, but still your experience of a particular thing like a wine or a strawberry or whatever is because of the combination of receptors that gets triggered. And so um, clearly when, when somebody might say, oh, that wine has an element of leather in it, I guarantee you the winemaker did not put any leather in that wine, okay? But there is something in that wine that is, uh, it's actually triggering the same combination of receptors that leather would, okay, or black cherries. And so I think a little later we'll talk about um, uh, some more about how wine is made uh, um, and what are legal additives and what are not, okay? Um, but so with that, uh, the one legal additive uh, to wine in terms of flavoring is oak. And so we're going to taste an oak Chardonnay um, and compare it to an unoaked. I think we'll actually start first with the unoaked. Yep. Okay, so we'll turn it over to you. So let's let them get started yep. for a second. So, so yes, please, um, the unoaked wine is the one we're going to start with. And again, you can read on your piece of paper there to see which one is which. I would suggest that you smell the wine uh, first. Okay. Huh? That's coming. We'll good get to question. that in a second. Black cherries. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> I think we've lost them already. What? <laughs> I think we're losing them. So that was a good question. What, what are we smelling for? OK, so has everybody had a chance to smell the two wines? I know some of you probably already consumed all the wine, but... <laughs> okay, so, can I get your attention? Hello? So the unoak Chardonnay is actually, um, I would say, the simple, simpler version, okay? Um, what you have there are flavors from the grape, and from, I believe in this case, both fermentations. Uh, to me, it, this smells like there's a little bit of um, a, a malolactic. So the malolactic fermentation um, enhances the fruitiness. So the fruitiness is, um, comes, some of it comes from the fruit. It's mostly a transformation of the fruit. So wines don't taste like grapes. I mean, a little bit, maybe. Some more than others, but mostly what you're, the smells that you're getting there are actually produced by the yeast. Um, some of them the yeast just make uh, all the time, and some of them are conversions of substances that were in the grape that have been converted into something else by the, by the yeast fermentation. And so that's where we get very interesting flavors we call varietal flavors. So Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc taste different because the grapes had something different in them that the yeast converted into what we now smell. So the, the fruitiness is, is, is funny because it's actually produced by the yeast. They're esters, which are products of fermentation, and they, they smell really fruity. And you might think, oh, I'm smelling the fruit. No, you're smelling the yeast. But uh, we call it fruity anyway. Um, it, it, they are the same chemicals that are found in various fruits, like strawberries or peaches and what have you. So yes, it, it, it has a genuine fruity smell. Now, this wine has also been through malectic fermentation. And that, um, depending on how it's done, can impart a distinctive butteriness. And you may have heard of Chardonnays or tasted Chardonnays, which are actually, there's one in the market called butter. Okay. And many years ago, when I first went to Davis, the buttery Chardonnays were all the rage, and everybody made really buttery Chardonnays, and thank goodness that trend is over. <laughs> um, 
I mean, you would open the bottle of Chardonnay and it was like you walked into a movie theater. Because <laughs> the same chemical, it's called diacetyl, we'll write it down, it'll be on the quiz. Um, diacetyl is made by the malactic bacteria. And winemakers can tweak the amount, uh, adjust the amount, depending on how they run that fermentation. So they can make it very, very moderate, or in, in the case of that wine called butter, they do their tricks and ramp it up. And so it really has an intense buttery smell. So, so this wine is uh, simpler. It still has some nice acidity to it. Now the other one is oaked. And as Holly mentioned, oak is a legal, basically a legal flavoring, okay? When we talk about wines, you know, having a chocolatey aroma or raspberries or whatever, winemakers do not add those things, okay? It's completely illegal to add what are considered flavorings in making grape wine. If you add that, you have to legally disclose that in some way to the consumer. So you might see um, with, flavor, with added flavors or something on the label. And right now in the market, there's a, a brand called Stella Rosa. Some of you may have, well, if you're in California, I know you've seen the billboards because they're everywhere. I don't know how popular that is out here. But anyway, that wine is, um, has some of the wines are flavored. Okay, they actually add uh, fruit juices or various flavorings. And that's perfectly legal, but you have to let the consumer know that you have doctored the wine, okay? So your regular wine, you're not allowed to do anything except oak. So oak is a legal uh, flavoring, okay? Um, and this wine has some of that. And um, oaky Chardonnays are, are, I mean, that's the most widely consumed wine in the, in the U.S. And I think it's because in the U.S. we love our vanilla. And oaky flavors are very similar to vanilla flavors. Um, and, and we know that this is popular because bourbon is very popular. Anybody here like bourbon? <laughs> um, so bourbon is basically vanilla flavor in a bottle. And Coca-Cola. The colas are also very vanilla-based, vanilla and lots of other foods or desserts are vanilla-based. So we're, we love our vanilla. So oaky Chardonnays, that's the, the reason we love it. And, and if I can just jump in real quick. I had a quick question. As a novice wine person myself, what, what am I tasting? What am I looking for when I taste a wine? So you said, of course, the oak. But <clears throat> there must be other elements. You mentioned acidity. Well, okay, so the basic things, wine is tart or sour, right? And there's a balance between the amount of tartness and the amount of sweetness. Usually with what we call table wines, the, the sweetness is very low, right? But we, it, we have a moderate amount of acidity. So if you had no acidity, it wouldn't taste like wine at all. So acidity is the most important flavor there really, as, as a flavor for wine. Um, now, when you start looking at different wines and different flavors, I think the, the next thing which winemaker, or winemakers and, and wine uh, tasters talk about is the persistence in the mouth, okay? Call it the body, um, mouth feel. You wanna have something, so after you swallow, you wanna have some persistence in the mouth, okay? So that's, that's another really basic thing. If, if there's no persistence, you'd say it, it tastes watery, right? And then on top of that, now you have all the varietal flavors. And that's where you get into um, the fruitiness, the oakiness. Um, I mean, where there are floral-based varieties like Riesling, uh, Muscats. Um, so then what, you have this basic flavor of um, tartness and some fruitiness from the fermentation. And that's really the foundation of all wines. Um, then you start adding you know, the complexity of the varietal flavor, whether it's the Cabernet flavor or the Pinot Noir. Everybody seems to like Pinot Noir. Um, and those, those are distinctive flavors that are really based on aromas. Um, 
So I don't know if that was answering your question or not. Oh, no, I'm just looking for a practical guide for how to assess the wine when I drink. So can I ask a few questions about g kinds of grapes? I mean, we've talked about grape varietals going into the different kinds of wine, but you go to the store and there's, you know, seedless Thompson grapes. There's other kinds of grapes. Um, so, so what's special about wine grapes? And what's special about the particular ones that are, are grown widely here? What's, you mean compared to table grapes? Is yeah, that, sure. Is that, so first of all, almost all wine grapes have seeds. Table grapes used to have seeds, but we've gotten rid of that. <laughs> uh, so, so when you buy grapes, you think that all grapes might be seedless, but they're not at all. Also, wine grapes are always small. Um, the table grapes you see, they've all been treated or they're cultivated to be much larger than normal grapes, so they're really tiny. They're about one gram. Mm -hmm. If you're, I don't know if you're familiar with weighing grapes, but they're really quite small. And so they have a lot, so what, what makes them different is they have a lot of skin and seed compared to the flesh. That's where the flavor comes from, right? So when you talk about a good wine grape, it, it has to have a, a more flesh and, and seed in order to have a lot of flavor, right? And then, then it's really the, the way the grape is grown. So let's say, you know, you like Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir has a very narrow range of climates in which it expresses that flavor. And have any of you seen the movie Sideways? <laughs> There was a disparaging remark there about Merlot. <laughs> Maybe you remember that. And what had happened is in the early 90s, Merlot was in great, it was very short supply. Prices were crazy. I mean, the grower prices, right? So all these people went out and planted Merlot all over the place and planted it in a bunch of lousy places. Consequently, 10 years later, there was all this Merlot in the market that was horrible which led to that perception that Merlot is crappy wine because it had been planted in the wrong places. So to get the really good flavors out of any of those grapes, you have to plant it in the right place. And, you know, for instance, in, in Napa Valley, you have the southern end of the valley, which is close to the, the bay, and it's cool. So there they plant Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and that's what grows well there. But as you go up valley, once you get past Yountville, you pretty much have to switch over to Cab and Merlot because it's too warm for those grapes. And if you plant, and this is actually this is a problem with Pinot Noir right now, it's, it's gotten planted because of sideways, it can plant in a bunch of lousy places. So you have to be careful about the Pinot. So anyway, so there has to be a match between the climate and that grape that allows the flavors to develop properly. So can we branch off and talk a little bit about climate? Because everybody knows climate is changing, and you know, maybe someday we'll be able to grow wine grapes in Indiana, but not. not well, they have them in southern Indiana now. <laughs> so, southern Indiana. So, so how, is, how, is, how is the changing climate going to change the wine landscape? Man, this is a topic of constant discussion amongst winemakers right now. Partly, well, the big issue in California are the fires. Like when I came to California 30 years ago, fires were not an issue. No one discussed fires. Smoke taint was unknown. I mean, the first time I tasted smoke taint was in 2008. And now it's like every year. Everyone's like, are we gonna have fires this year or not? So that, that's had an immediate impact um, because particularly at the high end. So what happened in 2020, we had those horrible fires in Napa. A third of Napa didn't get picked. Um, because the grapes were tainted and, and people were making, well, Napa's wine's very expensive, and no one said, well, you know, if I sell this bottle for $300, they do that, by the way, um, <laughs> I'm not going to put any taint, any tainted fruit into my wine because I don't want to com compromise my brand, my quality. Um, but aside from the smoke, I mean, the temperatures are rising, and, you know, so there's... I can tell you that the big companies are buying land up in Oregon and Washington um, in anticipation, right? They're thinking, well, you know, in 10 years, who knows, you're going to be able to grow in, in various places. Now, <clears throat> it's a big marketing problem for Napa. They've got this reputation, 
global reputation. People come and spend way too much money on the wine there. <laughs> and not to mention all the hospitality money. I mean, it's, it's a, there's more people come to Napa than Disneyland. It's a huge business. And, and what are they going to do? I mean, it's a, they really don't, I mean, you can adapt and they can spend gobs of money manipulating the vineyard. Um, and they'll be able to do that. They'll be able to make adjustments. But at some point, it, it, I'm not sure if it's going to work. So some people are planting different varieties to see what happens. Like, how does it turn out? But the big question is, are wine buyers going to drop $400 for Oh, Tempranillo, or Alianico. I, I, you know, that's, no one knows. You know, can, can we convert the uh, well-heeled Napa wine buyer to new varieties when they've learned for the last 20 years that Cab is what they should be spending their money on, Cabernet Sauvignon. That's the king. So, so um, to, to go back to some of those varietals, the Tempranillo is a Spanish wine, and so right. there, there are lots of options out there for wines that come from really hot places, but right. will, will the American wine buyer <laughs> adapt to those? Yeah. But yeah. so with that question then, um, you've got in front of you a couple of wines, actually, they're both Cabernet Sauvignon, but one of them is from a hotter temperature growing area, and one of them is from a cooler temperature growing area. And so uh, with the whites, you tasted the difference between oaked and un Oaked, okay, which is a very typical thing that you can go to your grocery store and look for one versus the other. And with the temperature difference, you need to know a little bit more of the area where it was grown. But you know, Washington State is obviously going to be cooler than Central California. And so uh, here we've got a couple of wines from these different areas. And so if you could so, maybe tell us so a little bit about that, yes. So go ahead and go ahead and smell the reds. So the, the one on the left is the one from Washington, and the one on the right is from California. Oh. So we had to show you this full screen just to show you the label. The three of us here are chemists. And so we look at this bottle, and we see a bottle of cesium, which, um, which is maybe not what you would go and, and jump to buy. Um, but uh, so that's, you know, anything chemically, chemically related um, jumps out at us. I usually have to buy those at the store, but no cesium wines. So. Yeah. So have you smelled the two wines? So the, the one on the left, um, I would say has more of a, well, I'll use the term vegetal. Um, both, I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly similar. But the one on the left is, um, doesn't have the fruit intensity that you smell in the one on the right. Um, there's also oak on both, so it's a little bit complicated. Um, but uh, there's a distinct difference in uh, what I call the fruit expression in the one on the left. Um, to me, it has a, a green, um, a, a, that's what I call it, a green vegetal aroma. Um, it's actually due to the presence of, um, you don't have this structure handy, but um, there's a class of chemicals called pyrazines, which are quite important in, in food aroma. And in, uh, in Cabernet, there's, some, there's pyrazines present um, if you harvest the grapes relatively unripe. So, and that's what happens in a cooler climate. You're essentially harvesting the fruit at a slightly less ripe condition. Um, and you end up with this, uh, this uh, aroma. Now, some people would say this aroma is really the more classic Cabernet smell because really for the past few hundred years, this is the way Cabernet smelled. Um, but <clears throat> you mentioned, you know Robert Parker. So Robert yes. Parker was a very famous wine writer, and he really liked extra ripe Cabernet. So he wrote about it and convinced, um, well, basically he moved the market. He was so powerful as a wine, wine uh, critic and judge 
So people started harvesting later and later to get fruitier aromas, so to please Robert Parker's palate. And that's more like the wine we have on the right. So the wine has lost that vegetal aroma, and it's really what winemakers would describe as red fruit and black fruit. Okay? So it's um, strong, intense fruitiness to the wine. And there's actually a, a chemical treatment <laughs> that's done to uh, further eliminate the... Um, so if you, add, if you add oxygen to the wine, small amounts of oxygen to the wine, uh, after the fermentation, it's called microox. And there's another movie where, another wine movie where this is mentioned. Uh, Mondovino, I don't know if any, it's less of, much more obscure than Sideways. But anyway, there's this famous wine, French wine expert who goes around and says, microox, microox, you have to use microox. Anyway, it gets rid of that vegetal aroma. Um, it's very effective. Um, but this, this wine on the right is definitely riper and has that, and to me, distinct red black fruit aroma. And then you can, I can also pick up a little oak in there. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by red fruit and black fruit, just to make sure that people <laughs> can visualize what you're talking about? Well, it's, um, well, blackberry um, or, or uh, currant, black currant. And also plums, probably, a little bit, maybe, sometimes? Yeah, you could say plums. Um, and then when you start talking about fruits, then there's also the difference between the fresh fruit and the, the jams. Yeah. So, so sometimes you might have more of a jammy blackberry than a fresh blackberry. Um, I don't know. Do you have a... Anybody? Okay. So we do poll here? Sure. Okay. Let's see, we're gonna add, well, let's compare, um, we'll do, I'll just say black fruit, so does, we have more fresh or, or jam. Say, so, okay, so raise your hand if you smell more fresh black fruit. And, and which one? The, the wine on the right, the wine on the right. So fresh black fruit, just a few hands, uh, jam, lots of hands, okay. Yeah. So it's more of the cooked mm -hmm. fruit aromas. Yeah, so Ken, right. you, look, give, him, give him a second and I get, of course, as time goes on, it gets harder. Yeah, they get harder. Sorry. Big classes, so we can bring you back if we have to, even if you're coughing. Well, wow. we might give them a minute to yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah the, the substance. Wait, 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 one minute. And we'll talk about what they're experiencing, yeah. Yeah, so actually, if you add oxygen to the wine, yeah, you can. Um, it actually, it's actually microbial. The yeast actually produce acid aldehyde. Um, and it even even if the even if the fermentation is over, yeah. the yeast are still around. Mm -hmm. We add oxygen; they'll make acid aldehyde, and that somehow just eliminates the vegetable yeah. aroma. Interesting. Yeah, That's really it's cool. extremely effective. Interesting. Yeah, we were we were doing an experiment with. Uh, I cut through the. <coughs> we wanted a wine that hadn't been treated that much. Oh, no, 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 contacted no, our no, collaborators. No, 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 so we, we want, you know, we, we need 20 gallons of do I, cab that hasn't been like that. I don't know if we can find pretend it. Pretend they're in Gen Chem. Like, well, it's a university. Gen Chem? Well, not pretend it's France, though, right? No, no, no. no. But, but well, if you want to please Robert Parker. I got low sift scores back there. Uh, Andy. <laughs> Andy, I, Andy I, had a, I had a real quick question, okay? So as we're drinking these red wines, Oh, I just had a quick question for Andy. So as we're, as we're trying out these red wines, okay, and you mentioned Robert Parker. I mean, wasn't he the guy who developed this 100-point scale for rating wines? Like, so when I go into a wine shop, I yeah. see these 88, 99, 90, whatever. I mean, what does this number mean? 
All right, this is a mysterious system. <laughs> so Robert Parker essentially invented the 100-point scale. Now, lots of other Rhine writers have adopted that system as a concept, but it's very problematic. And the reason is that wines have many different flavors, and for instance, um, if, you have a tart, if you have a tart wine, let's say you have a German, a dry German Riesling, you'd expect that to be very tart, right? And so you, you would rate the wine highly if it was tart. But if you had a California Chardonnay with the same level of tartness, you'd say, oh, that's not right. So your rating would drop, but the number is not going to reflect anything about what you tasted or what the issue was. So, in general, you have to know who the, who the author of that scale is and what they're trying to evaluate. So you're saying it's completely subjective, it's just based on that wine critic? <laughs> well, basically, there's, okay, so the way it works is there's an expectation when we call something a, a California Cabernet, that judge or wine writer has in their mind what that wine should taste like. Okay, and so they, have a, they use a scale for that. But they'll use a completely different flavor profile for judging, say, a Tempranillo, or again, a Chardonnay. So you have to have an idea of what it is they're judging. And what's, what has happened is that Parker had this, uh, he really loved these really lush, rich uh, red wines, and a lot of people tried to make, or were making wines to please him, Right? But then, of course, a bunch of, peop a bunch of winemakers are like sick of this. <laughs> because even Parker would admit that those wines were not good with food. They were just <laughs> too rich. And so luckily now, there's a, the things are moving back to leaner, more, um, uh, more tart wines. And, and so, you know, if you prefer those lean, tart wines, you have to know, okay, which wine writer likes that or talk, and then you have to read the description. Like, you can't just go by the number. So that's pretty cool. So you said that, so Robert Parker was so influential, folks were making wines to suit this person's particular the, taste. The top wine companies in the world, in Bordeaux, were adapting their production technology to please his palate. So, so you're saying that you can engineer wine to make it suit certain palates? Is that, is that what you you're can, saying? You can, yeah, yeah. Winemakers make a difference. How, how do you engineer <laughs> wine? <laughs> huh? How, how do you engineer wine? I mean, what are the knobs, if you will, the turn? Ripeness. Ripeness. That's the most important. It's, that's why that picking decision is so critical. When you pick has a huge impact on the style. And what's happening now is people are picking earlier. What they're doing is they're picking, so we use a scale to measure the amount of sugar, it's called a brick scale. And in the old days, like in the 70s, you picked at 23 bricks. Well, that's moved all the way up to 28, and there are instances where you pick and it ends up being around 30. So those wines are really high in alcohol, like 16% alcohol. Now, you can also add water, which cuts it, cut, anyway. Okay, I'll, but now people are moving back to harvesting, say, at 25 or 26 instead of 28, which makes the wine, at the end of the day, it, okay, so the other thing is that as the, as the grapes ripen, the amount of acid drops. So if you harvest earlier, you have more natural tartness and less alcohol at the end of the day. But the flavor is not as intensely fruity. So it's a, a, it's a more subtle wine. And, Andy, these, are, these sound like very natural things to do for your wine, but you know, as a chemist, and let's say I have access to some equipment here, could, could I engineer my own wine? Oh, you want to make it with chemicals? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, there's a couple people trying that. Um, you can actually, to, to, you can reproduce the smell of a wine pretty accurately with chemicals. Okay, so you can, you, can, you can measure, you can do what's called gas chromatography. You're familiar with that. You measure the, the things that are volatile. So you can measure what's in the wine, and then you can reconstruct that. And you can produce something which, if you just smell it, it's hard to tell the difference with the wine. 
Okay? Now, the problem is once you put it in your mouth, you realize it's not wine at all, right? <laughs> and, and that's been the challenge is trying to, uh, to build the, I would say, the non-volatile component to, to reproduce that. Um, but I think, it, what's, I, I think it's interesting that people think that they're going to, um, if, if they're going to be able to reconstruct chemically a wine in the future, and this may happen, they'll be able to take chemicals, mix them together, and make something that exactly mimics Chateau Petrus. Now, if you know, Chateau Petrus sells for about $5,000 a bottle. I've never, oh, I, did I taste Petrus? I think I tasted, I think I tasted once. That somebody else bought. <laughs> but it was, I didn't buy the bottle. So, so in the future, it's possible, as a chemist, I have to have faith in my fellow chemists that someday we will be able to reproduce uh, Petrus exactly. But it will not be worth $5,000 because it didn't come from that vineyard. When people buy wine, one of the reasons they're willing to pay, say, more than $100 is because it's coming from a very specific vineyard and they can go and see that vineyard and it's a, you know, it's a famous place. So there's a reputation and a tradition and a scarcity. There's only so many grapes in that vineyard. And that's, that's by the way, that's the business model of most of the Napa operations is there's scarcity so they can charge more money. If you can make a bazillion gallons of it in a chemical factory, then there's no scarcity, and then how can you charge more for it? Actually, the analogy that you used um, when we were talking about this earlier was diamonds, right? So, so synthetic diamonds can be really quite beautiful, but they're not going to get the same price as a, as, as a natural mine diamond, and I think there's a very strong similarity between those two. But now that we're talking about kind of synthetic versus natural wines, one of the things that, that um, is starting to become more and more popular is, is people advertising wines as being natural or organic or also sulfite free. And so we're wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those, what those labels mean and are, are they just, do they mean something significant for somebody who wants to either drink good wine or be healthy, okay, or are they just marketing ploys? Okay, I, I can see some younger people here. So, how many of you here? <laughs> how, how many of you here ha, would say you like natural wine? One, two. Come on, come on. If you're under thirty, I know you're buying natural wine. Okay. So, natural wine is a, a bit of a, a a bit of a controversy in the business. Um, some European winemakers say that natural winemakers are selling. Um, snake oil, or, well, they don't use that word. Um, and it, the, the term natural wine suggests, and it implies in the market that you make the wine with little intervention, right? So you just pick the grapes, you throw them in a bin, in a, in a barrel, and they ferment, and then you put it in the bottle, and you're all done. You don't, don't add anything, right? Well, <clears throat> If you do absolutely nothing, okay, if you just pick the grapes, throw them in a container, and leave them there, they will 100% guarantee you they will turn to vinegar, okay? <laughs> That's the natural end point, okay? So you have to intervene in some way to make wine. And the question is, how much intervention is okay? So in the market, there's all these conventions that have evolved. There's no legal regulation of the term natural, okay? So the government, doesn't regulate it. If you can put, you could put natural wine on any wine and you would not get in any legal trouble. Now in the market, the people who buy and trade and sell natural wine will, they have their standards, right? And so they will ask lots of questions like, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you add yeast? God forbid. And then if you did, like, oh, that's not really natural wine. You're cheating, okay? So there's a lot of conventions in the market that are, the evolved, right, that define natural wine today. Um, now, I'm proud to say there's some Davis graduates who are in that market, and they say that their tr technical training in science allows them to make better natural wine because they understand the process and they know how to manage it better and avoid, for instance, having the wine be like 10% vinegar, which does happen. And those wines are sold, and 
I wouldn't personally like to drink them, but some people do, and they pay real money for them. So anyway, so that the natural wine is, and, but in the market, it's like the one sector that's growing like crazy. So it's it's interesting to see that happen. We had one of the one of the one of the um, I would say the leading uh, California brands is is Martha Stuman. We had her come and speak at Davis a few months ago, and you know it, it's it, 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 you know she talked about how it was similar to the organic food movement like 30 years ago, or well maybe more like 50 years ago. <laughs> So, Andy, just out of curiosity, there's a distinction between natural and organic, yes? Yes. That gets, that's gets pretty technical. Oh, okay. Do you want me to do that? <laughs> no, no, I think we'll enjoy the wine. So, so we have a question here. Why, why don't we ask? Uh, I read an article many years ago about a wine lover who was a wine connoisseur and he was interested in the natural Yes. And he went back 50 or 60 years, and he took the rainfall, how much, when it occurred, the temperatures, the weather, and everything, and he put it in a formula. And as I remember it, it proved to be a very reliable formula for predicting, even before the wine had just put the bottle, how great or how ungrate that vintage was going to be. Is that, was that true, or is that been disproven? And can you no. repeat the question, because the rest of them can't hear it? Okay, so the question was, has anyone created a mathematical model to predict wine quality based on climate, et cetera? And then, yes, that person is an economist from Princeton. His name is Orly Ashenfelter, and he publishes a uh, newsletter called Liquid Assets. <laughs> now, he, his formula was based on weather in Bordeaux. And what he was concerned with was the secondary, he, so he cares about what's called the secondary market, which is the, you know, sort of the auction market of wines that are being traded after they're originally sold, okay? So, so a lot of the big houses in Bordeaux, they sell you know, like essentially two years after harvest, and every year, okay, so if you're in the business, you want every year to be a great year, right? So, you want to make sure that when people come to buy your wine, they're enthusiastic and they will put out as much money as you can, that they can tolerate, right? So you don't want anyone to know that it might not be a good year. So, so, so Orly kind of undercut the business model in Bordeaux, like a lot. And so he's not a very welcome guest <laughs> in, in Bordeaux. Because he then started, based on weather data, predicting, like, right in December, like, okay, this harvest, like the, you know, 20, whatever, 19 year is going to be, you know, good on this scale based on the weather, and everyone would know that when they went to buy the bottles, like, when they were new, right? So, well, he was an economist. He thought this was cool, right? <laughs> um, but yes, and, and so, he is, as far as I know, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's he's famous. In, I mean, he's a he's a very, in fact, he may he's still alive. I mean, some people have suggested he may get the the Nobel Prize in economics, but it hasn't happened yet. So, he's a, he's a very very good economist. So, the wine is just like a sidelight for him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, his his, his models are, are now everyone everyone uses his model. Yeah. But it's for Bordeaux specifically. For Bordeaux yeah. specifically, yeah. Yeah. Can you touch upon uh, wine and the relationship with food? I know they always talk yeah. about like wine pairs. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Um, obviously, there are certain rules, and that people generally use their vision on that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> a couple things. So. Oh, repeat the question. Okay. The question was. 
about wine and food pairing and are there rules for this? There are, <coughs> um, but they're very basic. So essentially, okay, so I'll, I'll, the way I had this explained to me was the ideal blend of flavors is actually in a very good sauce, like a French sauce. And what it is, the reason it's good is a mixture of acid and sweetness. See, acid, sweetness, umami, and salt. So a very good sauce, you would say start with a pan with some meat drippings there, and you would add some wine to it, which is the acid, you would add some salt, and you would put a little flour in there and, and cook that, and you would make a sauce, and you would have all four of those things balanced. Okay? So pairing wine, you're trying to achieve something similar. Wine is basically acid, okay? So you can pair it with a number of other foods, but one thing that doesn't work is something that's very tart. So like, like a lemon, uh, lemon meringue pie would be terrible with wine because you're essentially pairing a very tart food, well, if you don't use too much sugar, with a tart wine, with wine, and it doesn't work. So that's, usually you get a fail when you, when you have wine paired with a very tart food. Um, but the, well, okay, so one example I really like, and this is actually my son introduced, well, my son runs a, a beer garden in Washington, D.C., so anyway, he, he came home. Yeah. Huh? Beer garden You know that? Oh, uh, no. Which, which, one? One? which one? Yeah. Uh, it's called um, Garden District. 14, 14th and <laughs> Huh? All right, all right. Uh, so he came home and he brought home caviar and, and caviar with sparkling wine and potato chips. And um, my wife was like, really? You're going to have potato chips? Can't you do better than that? But it's actually the perfect combination because it's got the tartness. So sparkling wine is usually very tart. Um, actually, it's made from grapes that are harvested really early, so they're re it's the, the really high acid levels is in, in sparkling wine. So that the tartness, then you have the, the salt from the potato chips, um, and you have the umami from the uh, caviar. And what am I missing? Salt? Be Sweet sugar, but, uh, sweetness, well, it depends on, on the potato chip. There might be a little bit of sweetness there or, or in the sparkling. But, I mean, you have that combination of umami and tartness and salt. It's actually a really good wine and food pairing. Um, now, there's, <clears throat> of course, there's a lot of traditional pairings, and, and some are better than others. Um, I really like... Um, a uh, shellfish like crab with Chardonnay. I, I don't know why that, and I can't explain it. I, it's just, if whenever we get crab, I want to have a Chardonnay. Um, so to me, that's just this combination that works. And then there's one that I think is totally disgusting. Um, foie gras and sautern. It's just, oh my God. It's a very famous, like supposed to be a good pairing. But to fatty me, and, it's... Fatty and sweet. Ugh. That's, that's yeah. I, I cringe. <laughs> yes? Basically, the, you can. Oh, the question was, what is the, what's the key to a location that grows good grapes, right? And it it really has to do with the climate. Okay, so the climate has to be what's called. It basically has to be like a Mediterranean temperate climate. So it has. You have to winter. It can't be too cold. It can't be too hot. So you have to have, go it's a Goldilocks location, right? So, so you, 
grape vines, vinifera, Vitus vinifera, which is the European wine grape, not the grapes that are grown around here, okay? Um, cannot not the tolerate, wild grapes. Let's just not be the wild grapes. That cannot tolerate hard freezes, okay? So you can get down to freezing, you get maybe a few degrees below freezing, but once you get more than 10 degrees below freezing, then vinifera starts like dying or, or partially dying or whatever. So it can't get too cold. And then it has to have, usually winter, um, it's best to have winter rainfall, but you can have summer rainfall. But, and, and it can't be, of course, super hot, okay? But, and, and we actually categorize vineyards by the, what's called degree days. So we actually quantify the amount of heat, summer heat, with a scale. And depending on the, where you are on that scale, you, it, certain varieties do better than others. Now, I have to say, one time I went to Ur Uruguay in South America, and I was expecting, you know, to have a really painful week of tasting. Um, but, you know, they, you know, it rains there all the time, and you think, oh my God, they must have moldy grapes, and it would be horrible. But, you know, it turns out in lots of places that have a moderate temperatures, not too hot, not too cold, irrespective of other factors, you can, if you work hard at it, you can make fabulous wine. And see that in lots of places, like in California, there's areas that are not famous. They can grow fantastic grapes if they work at it. Yes? Oh. Yeah, I was just going to ask about that. Like, uh, you know, wine grape growing in California has expanded, like, into San Joaquin Valley, which is hot and dry. And, you know, I just wonder, like, what kind of grapes are produced there? Like, okay. how, how does their quality compare to the more famous areas like Napa Valley and Sonoma? That, so, there, so the issue there is if it's too hot, the grapes will still grow, but the quality will not be there. And so in a very hot regions, they can grow lots and lots of grapes. The, the vines can be extremely productive, but the quality is, is not there. So that's where you get the $5 wine, or the $2 wine <laughs> is grown in a hot climate. You got somebody over there, I guess. She's been trying it. That's a great question. Can you repeat it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the, the question was, you know, where do these grapes come from? Are they cultivated? Or are they... Uh, so the traditional varieties are all cloned, meaning they're, you take cuttings. Grapes actually don't cross very efficiently. Um, and, and, and wine, wine drinkers are extremely conservative, so there are places that are breeding new uh, grape vines, but it's really hard to get them into the market. Even if the ta tastes are great, um, there's a variety, a German variety called Schrebe, which is, according to my German friend, makes better wine than, than Riesling. It'll probably be 100 years before it dominates in the market. Um, so the... The grapes are all, um, uh, did I answer your question? Well, do you ever use wild as one of the Oh, do questions. we ever use wild grapes? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are, there are wild grapes um, in almost all the temperate climates around the world. In California, there's a, a, a grapevine called Vitus californica. The, the fruit is really tiny. I've heard of one person who tried to make wine from it, but you know, basically you harvest for three days and you make one bottle. There's a question okay, there's also some people over there after, uh, yeah. sorry. Okay, are you asking about Sauvignon Blanc particular? Okay, so the question is, what do I think of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc versus California? I, I really, first of all, I love New Zealand. Um, I've been there several times. I'd like to move there someday. <laughs> My wife doesn't want to. Anyway, um, so they, they have a very particular style there. 
Um, and it turns out that actually the chemists here would love, I can explain that, it's going to take like 10, 15 minutes to explain how the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is constructed, but it's actually an artifact of processing technologies which all, it were implemented by accident, right? So they, they machine harvest, that's a real critical factor. They have, they have a lot of rain, so they have a lot of um, mold sprays. So they have to have that spray on the grape when it comes in, and then they have to ferment a certain way, and da 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 So it's, it's actually an artifact of a very peculiar processing technology. Um, so that can be adopted. So, so people in other countries have sort of adapted that technology, and they can reproduce the wine almost perfectly. Um, but in, in warmer climates than New Zealand, you, Sauvignon Blanc also grows and makes, I think, fantastic wines. Um, it, it's one of the varieties where you can grow it in different places. You get different wines, but they can be, not, not all of them are great, but they can be really wonderful. And, you know, like, like from a warmer climate, you can get more of a tropical or, or a, a stone fruit flavors, and, and really, they're wonderful wines. Thank you. We have lots of questions here. Andy, the class of 77 thanks you once again. <laughs> Are you okay? So the the question was about organic wine, and then there was a disparaging remark about California. <laughs> Some shade. So organic. Okay. So in the United States of America, organic wine means that you use organically grown grapes, which is that's like growing anything or growing it organically. So that is completely a farming issue. Right, so you grow, you, you use the same limitations as growing organic strawberries. And then, in the winemaking process, the one thing you cannot use is sulfites or sulfur dioxide. Now, it turns out sulfur dioxide is like this magical preservative, which is used at multiple stages in conventional winemaking. And if you don't use it, you have to be super careful to avoid a whole bunch of issues, including the wine tasting sort of like pickle juice, or tasting sort of like sherry, because you're avoiding, you prevent the growth of certain lactic bacteria that grow in, when you make pickles or kimchi. They will grow in wine, and sulfites prevent that. Okay, so if you're not super careful and you don't know what you're doing, you can end up with wine, which, as my wife said, this tastes like pickle juice. Um, so the, because of that, the organic market in the United States is very small. In Europe, they can use sulfites in making organic wine. And they have a, like, a, a, like, I don't know, a measurable market share. But in the United States, the market share for organic wine is less than 1%. And what was your other question was what some... <laughs> you know, you can, you can grow, you can make great wine everywhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yay. Ah, yes. And very expensive. <laughs> so do you want me to explain uh, uh, what ice wine is? Okay, so the question was, what is ice wine? So ice wine, and in the US and in Canada, they have a common definition, means that the grapes are left on the vine until, and this is, there's, I forget the technical numbers, but they have to have a temperature below, say, um, I remember this one number, minus eight centigrade, so it's eight, about 10, 20 degrees below, so around zero for a certain number of hours which means the, the, the water in the, in the berries actually freezes. You get crystalline ice in the berries, okay? So the juice, and this is the chemist here will appreciate, the juice actually gets a freezing of pure water. 
So you have pure ice crystals. What that means is that the rest of the juice that's left over is really concentrated now with sugar. And then you, you press that fruit, and then doing that, by the way, is quite tricky. Our, our Davis graduate went down there, didn't know what she was doing, and she actually broke her press. It tipped over because she didn't, she didn't do it right. So you have to be careful. You squeeze out that. It's essentially very highly concentrated uh, sugar juice out of the fruit, and you ferment that. And because it's sugar is so concentrated, usually you just get a, a brief fermentation. Well, actually, it takes a long time, but you only ferment a little bit of the sugar. So you have really modest alcohols and lots of sugar left over. But it's hard to do because you have to wait. You have to leave the, the grapes on the vine basically until Christmas. If you get a heavy rainfall, you lost the crop. So it's risky. Um, and of course, you have to go out and harvest in, the, in like in the middle of the night. <clears throat> so it's, it's expensive. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> the question was, <laughs> if I could only have one wine the rest of my life. <clears throat> okay, so I don't like that question. <laughs> I usually say, okay, so, you, so you're very clever. So usually the question is, what's your favorite wine? And what I say is, um, the wine of the late, latest Davis graduate who sent me a box of their wine. <laughs> um, I don't, I, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I, no, I don't think I can answer that. I don't think there's any one wine. I think I would get bored no matter what it was. Uh, <laughs> okay. So one time I made a Zinfandel. I like Zinfandel, I'll tell you, I like Zinfandel because when I was a grad student and I started to discover wine, I couldn't afford Cabernet. So I could afford <laughs> Zinfandel. <laughs> Dan so and I were in the same situation. <laughs> <laughs> Team Zinfandel. So I learned to appreciate the flavors of Zinfandel. And one year I, made, I was making wine with my friends and we were getting these overripe grapes that were very mediocre. And the alcohols were really high, and it was just, I just got sick of it. I said, we can, I'm not, I don't want to have anything. We crushed the fruit, and it, it was like 29 bricks. I was like, I don't want to have anything to do with this wine. It's going to be horrible. I, I won't be able to drink it. It's too high in alcohol, too rich, da 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 So we added a boatload of water to it and some acid. So, so we, we did what's called amelioration. Now, that's legal, like you can add water. But we, so we had the basis of the wine was this ripe Zinfandel, which had the flavor that I like, but the alcohol level was normal. And, and we, we started pouring that wine, and it, it was like you would, you know, you, it'd be the end of dinner, and the, and the wine's all gone. It's like, what happened? Like, it was, it was, it, it, per, it complimented food. It didn't, it didn't shout at you like it was a very modest wine, but it perfectly complimented the food. If I could get that, and I, I can't have been able to make it since, but you know, like if I could get that wine, that would be my favorite. And then maybe uh, something white, like a, a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to probably need to, to finish up here. Uh, you, okay. Well, we got, we got three. Like, that's a 77, and I don't know where we got this guy, but we, every Friday, we used to use MD 2020. So there you go. So you brought us a long way. Thank you. All right. Okay. I think we can do, do a few more questions. So the question was about the box wine. So, and cans. And also oh, and cans. cans. Well, she okay. said box and she said cans. Okay, so box wine, so there's actually a few companies putting better wine in boxes. The only thing about the boxes is that the container does not keep out oxygen as well as a glass bottle with a cork in it. So 
it, 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 so the wine can be perfectly fine, can be excellent. Um, most people won't put very expensive wine into a box no matter what. But you can get good wine in a box, but never keep it around for very long. Literally after three months, the flavors will be changing because of oxidation, and in six months, it's probably toast. And if you have like an old box that you bought a year ago, like, good luck. <laughs> it should tell you on there, it should have a date and a use by date, and believe me, you want to pay attention to that. <laughs> Up there? Up behind, behind you. We'll get to you next. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so muscadines are, are completely different species, okay? The flavors are really not the same as we normally expect. Um, I've had muscadines. I think they're okay. Um, I, I brought some to a lab party, and, and basically there were a couple people that were like, I'm not, I'm not drinking that stuff. They, they had had a bad experience. Uh, but the reason that is grown is that there's a disease called Pierce's disease which devastates vinifera. And there's a guy at Davis, Andy Walker, who developed, uh, I think, five new selections that are PD resistant. And they can be grown in Florida and Georgia and Alabama. And people down there are planting this stuff like crazy. And so, in, in another 10 years, they will be making much better wine. Um, well, unless you like muscadine wine, then that's fine. But <laughs> if you like vinifera wine, they'll be making um, much more of that style of wine. Uh, and, and so the whole South will be able to grow that. Now, the climate down there, you know, it's not probably the best. I mean, it rains a lot in the summer, and I don't know, it's kind of hot. So I don't know what effect that'll have. And the gentleman had a question there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, sometimes you know, we see fruit wines on the shelf in the grocery store, blueberry, strawberry. Um, will those, you know, do, do those typically have those flavors added, uh, or are those more of the natural flavors of the grapes um, that resemble those fruits? Well, if it if it says blueberry wine, it should be made from blueberries. Yeah. So it, it could be a blend of blueberries and maybe other fruit. But it, if it says blueberry wine, it should be. <clears throat> It'll have some juice from the. Yeah. Yes. From no, you'll see that, especially around here in Michigan, there's a lot of fruit wine that is there made are. cherry wine, blueberry wine, all of these things. And yeah. it is made from the, the juice of those fruits. Okay. And with, with grapes, but well, not necessarily. It could be just completely, so I would read on it what it says, but sometimes it is made just straightforwardly. And there may be some people here that were in actually one of our fermentation classes when we taught them way back, and some of the people would actually make fruit-based wine. Some of them work and some of them don't, and it's a fun experiment. So before we, before we do the last couple of questions, before I, we wanted to present Andy with a... A, a small, token. small wow. token of our appreciation from yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think they're gonna they're gonna bring out the hook here in a second. So is there one more question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. It is legally uh, regulated as a wine. Okay, so mead is, is complicated because you can make mead, the regulations on meads are kind of weird. You can make mead with just honey, okay. or you can add fruit. Now, <clears throat> here's the catch. If you make it with only honey, there's virtually no acidity. So it's very soft in the mouth, whereas you can add grapes or, or other fruit and then it's, it changes the taste completely, right? So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Yes, it can be both. It can be both, yeah. Yes and no is the answer. Right. 
So we have, we have one more announcement that we need to. Okay. So there was a raffle apparently. And so they're looking for the winners. So Julie M. Barron, Stephen Walker, and Frank Miller. So if those are you, then, then there's a Woo talk to Lisa down here. <laughs> All right, I guess we're done. <laughs> okay, are there any last questions? Okay, you got, we got one more. He's been trying and I forget if you can see me. Uh, I don't know if this question makes sense. Like, okay, so you talked about how yeast uh, will process compounds in the graves and that yeast in the grave. Uh, has it, is it possible to develop like a GMO grape that would provide engineered flavors that show up in a wine? Does it, is anyone trying to do that? Okay, so the question is, could you make a GMO grape that would make specific flavors. Right. I'm, well, the technology for that is in its, well, the technology exists. There hasn't been enough research on what those flavors are back to the genetic level. So we don't know which genes yet are making, say, the flavors of Pinot Noir, OK? Um, but that will happen. Sooner, however, once, because we do know what the chemicals are, we don't know what the genes are in the grapes. I think I, I've been telling my students that during their professional lifetime, they're going to be faced with the problem of somebody saying, if you use this yeast, this GMO yeast, this will make the flavor of, that you want to make. So if you want, you want, it, you want your wine to taste like uh, Tempranillo from uh, Navarra, right? Use this yeast and your wine will taste like that. And then the question is, is that legal, you know, like we, 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 we outlaw the use of flavorants in making a wine. If you're using a yeast that produces a specific flavor, what's that? So we got to get the lawyers involved, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we should thank Andy, okay? Thank you. <laughs>